test. Okay. All right, everyone, please open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Oh, we have a uh, familiar story of power, authority, humility, and healing. So we're going to uh, read it together. This is one of my favorite times of the service. We'll read the gospel out loud as a family together. So we'll read, uh, yeah, from verse 1 to verse 10. Let's read together. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum, there a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd and following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The very, the very words of God. Amen. Um... Here's the gospel. It's the news which turns up, down, and down, up. It's, it's a message of reversal. Uh, the other word we use is called inversion. Some of you know that I'm a fan of origami. And in origami, uh, there is called, there's what's called a yama ori which is like, a, literally it's the, the mountain fold. You take the paper and you fold it this way. And that's the mountain. And then there's what's called an, a, a tani, tani ori. And tani means valley. So basically instead of this shape, you get this shape. But what I love about origami is when you make a yama ori, often your intention is to invert the yama ori into a tani ori, and vice versa. So it starts as a fold in one direction, but it ends in a fold in the other direction. And what comes is something beautiful, a work of art. That is the gospel. Let me give you an example. Jesus says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. That's called inversion. Yeah? Jesus says, uh, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you have to become a servant. Right? That's inversion. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed. But then it dies and it's planted and it grows into the biggest and most, and, and most uh, basically, not the biggest, but, well, yeah, the biggest, but what he means is the fullest, the, the, the richest, the most leafy and branchy tree 
in all, all the, the plants. I'm not a, what is it? Bot botanist, thank you, botanist, but that's according to Jesus, okay? So, uh, inversion, the smallest thing becomes the great, okay? Are we, are, does that make sense? If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to understand the gospel, and if you want to understand your Bible, you have to understand this principle, this method that God does. He turns the inside out. He turns the bottom up. And I want to show you three things in this that is happening with inversion. This, is a, this should be a surprising text. This is uh, amazing scripture. Uh, maybe we're too familiar, or maybe we don't have imagination, or we don't understand the context. But here, Jesus is flipping things upside down. There's three things. The first is uh, inversion of a kind of status, an inversion of nationality. Okay? So, the story is about a centurion. Now, maybe some of you... Your image right now is the image on your bulletin of a centurion. In the bulletin, at the bottom, you'll see a, the picture of a Roman soldier with a big hat and a helmet and a poofy. Yeah? Uh, okay. Just usually in sermons, okay, that's typically the image. Uh, just one little nitpicky point of history. It's a debate. But the Romans were not centurions in Israel until AD 44. So it's not likely that it was a Roman centurion. Just, I know it's, it's a nitpicky thing, but it's something I studied and learned. I think it's, it's important. It's a history. Okay? So what kind of centurion was it? Most likely a centurion of the army of King Herod Antipas. He was the wicked king of Jesus' day. And he also had his own little army. Not Jewish. Maybe foreign. Maybe Roman. Okay? But not a citizen of Rome. Here's what I mean. Maybe uh, a, a, a citizen of a member of a, a citizen of a country that Rome had conquered. Not a Jewish person. Because a Jewish person would not become a soldier to oppress his own people, okay? But anyway, small thing. Either way, <laughs> either way, Centurion is in charge of a century of men. He's the captain. A hundred men he leads. He is battle-tested. Maybe scars. He's, he's muscular, but not big. He, he's a fighter. The muscles are not for show. He's intelligent. You need intelligence not only to fight, not only to survive, but to lead hundred men. He was, in, he was not only a, 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 a warrior, not only intelligent, he was also wealthy. Wealthy. He had money because of the salary. He earned more than the typical soldier, obviously. And finally, I want you to notice about the centurion, is he has authority, obviously. The only people he answered to were his general, and the ones the general answered to was directly the Caesar. So he was a very high-ranking member. He was intelligent. Wealthy, powerful, strong. Now here's the inversion. He did not deserve grace. He did not deserve God's power. He did not deserve the help of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was from Israel. And Jesus was a Jewish healer. Jesus 
came to all the Jews. His message is for Israel. The gospel is Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Please stay with me. The people who were supposed to understand who Jesus is are the Jews. They're supposed to see it. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, living in Galilee, speaking Aramaic, Jew, father Joseph, descendant of David. The Jews rejected Jesus, and here is a foreigner, an oppressor, an outsider who understands the power of Jesus. And Luke tells us, the first shall be last. Not only that, the outsider will become the insider. Right? The foreigner becomes the native in God's eyes. So that's the first inversion. Now how does that help us to live our life? Well, how does that help us? It should humble us in one way. There are people we see who we think are naturally on the outside. They don't know the Bible like we do. They don't understand church like we do. Right? They haven't given enough offering as much as we have. They haven't come to church as much as... They don't get the grace that we get the grace that we have. No, 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 no. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. The outsider shall become the insider. That's one thing. But here's another. Christianity is different from other religions in this. We believe in mission. We believe in going out to the outsider and, and giving the message of God's grace. I was just uh, listening to a broadcast about Hinduism. Hinduism, the oldest living religion in the world, Hinduism does not believe in, in, in evangelism, in proselytizing, in convincing other people about its truth. And by extension, Hinduism doesn't believe in going out and converting people. And by extension, neither does Buddhism. So here in the land of the Buddhist, they don't care about you should come to our temple and to come to our shrine and learn our prayers and follow and worship our deity. They don't care about that. Of course they don't. Muslims are not evangelistic. They believe in one God. They're not out trying to convert. Jews don't care about evangelism. Why? What's the point? What's the point, Chris? Here's the point. Every religion ends up becoming a national religion. Hindus are primarily in and from India because they're identified with that land. Muslims are primarily in and of the Middle East, they come from that land. Buddhists primarily come, are in and around Asia. Christians, no, we don't believe that because just like the centurion, we believe the outsider is worthy of as much grace and love and forgiveness and blessing as the insider. God loved the world so much, he sent his son into the mission field. And the followers of Jesus, out of love for God, obeys Jesus out into the mission field. Now, does that mean, you know, this, this morning, I got a, 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 a knock on, no, no, somebody rang my doorbell. My babies were trying to take a nap, and then my, my house doorbell rings, king, ka dong ka dong ka ding or whatever, and I'm like, ugh! We're trying to take a nap with the babies. And who is it? The Jehovah's Witness. And I'm like, 
Lord God, I love you. I thank you for your kindness to me. But help me with these people right now. Um, I, don't I don't want to just say, go away. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But I'm not about to let them in and, and you know, disturb the, the quiet. So, so the Jehovah's Witness believe in evangelism, but on a different basis than us. Okay? And I'm going to get to that on the third point. But the whole point is we believe in, a, in evangelism, we believe in mission, we, we want to be involved in following Jesus to give the outsider the access and the, and the, uh, the access and the availability as the insider. The outsider gets as much treatment and blessing as the insider. That's the first thing. Okay, that's the inversion number one. Inversion number two. Inversion number two. Um, it's the direction of the movement. I, I couldn't find a clever way to do it, to say it. So here, I just want you to look at something. Look at uh, verse 3. Look at verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him. Okay? That's the first direction. The centurion hears about Jesus and sends the elders to Jesus for help. Okay? Now go down uh, to verse, um, verse 9. And then I think up here, 9 and 10... It's, oh, no, that's no, good, good, good. In verse 9, it says, Jesus heard this, right? And then look at verse 10. The men who had been sent returned. So, the word, this is on purpose. Luke is saying at the beginning of the story, the centurion heard about Jesus and sent his people. Okay? And then at the end of the story, Luke flips it, it reverses it, and says, Jesus heard of the faith of the centurion, and he sent his healing. Did you catch that? Do you see the, the symmetry? There's a hearing and a sending. A hearing and a sending. One hears of the authority and power and sends a prayer. And then at the bottom... The one who is in power and authority hears about the faith and sends the power. Yeah? That's beautiful, no? This is, for, this is on the side. This is parenthetical. This kind of symmetry, this harmony, this poetry, this beauty, it's everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere. And I just want to encourage you. If you're struggling to understand your Bible, if you're reading it every day, the more you read it, the more you discover things like this, the patterns and the repetition, oh, the, the Bible becomes so powerful and so deep. This theme of inversion, of parallel and, 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 and um, repetition, harmony, it, go, it goes all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's amazing. And oh, my prayer, my prayer is for us as a church to grow deep in the Word of God and to understand it well. So, this inversion of, of the centurion hearing and sending and then Jesus hearing and sending. What do we take from that? We see this. The centurion... Oh, it's too... Okay, this is great. I don't want to take too long. This is okay. But, um, the centurion understands that Jesus is far away. And so he wants Jesus to come near. And he's calling for Jesus. And Jesus is about to go in that direction. But Luke is showing us, up until this point, Jesus is touching. Jesus is speaking face to face. The, the blind and the lame are brought right in front of him, the lepers. And he has this power as a healer. But Luke is saying, our Jesus is so much more than just another faith healer. Hear me, people. Luke is a doctor, the author of this text. And Luke is showing Jesus as a healer of people's bodies. But listen, 
the word in Greek, healer, it's the same exact word as savior. In Greek, healer and savior are the same word. You see this? Luke is saying, Jesus is not just another healer. He is the savior, not only of our bodies, but of our hearts, mind, and soul, of our spirits. He did not just come to put our bodies together. He came to connect our souls together with God. That is why we pray for one another. That is why I ask you to pray for my Auntie Feli. I ask you to pray for my neck and my back. I ask you to pray. We pray for uh, Art. We pray for Fernando. We pray for um, Esther. And I know. Well, where's the healing? Where's the wholeness? We've been praying for so long. Yeah. We pray for Mihoko's daughter. We pray for your family, your relatives. And sometimes people don't get healed. But we understand there's so much more than a physical healing. That's the first thing. That Jesus can heal. He doesn't have to be physically present. But he can, be, he can heal. That's why we can pray here in 2020 in Mitaki, Hiroshima. And I can pray for my aunt in Vancouver, Creston, B.C., or in Louisiana or wherever. All right, so Jesus, it shows that Jesus was some man, but Luke inverts it and says he's more than that. But finally, the biggest point, the third point is here. The greatest inversion is the inversion of humility. That's the best I can come up with. Humility and worthiness. Okay, now, in our translation, it's not a translation, this is more of an interpretation, because there is three words, excuse me, one word that's repeated three times. And unfortunately, it's not that word that's repeated here. Um, here's, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Look at verse 4. Oh, no, 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 excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, oh, yeah, verse 4, at the end, verse 4. They came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this, okay? Now I want you to circle it, mark it, make a mental note. Deserves is this word in Greek, axios. It's the word worthy, okay? Worthy. That word is repeated two more times in verse 6. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I do not deserve. Okay? That's the same word, axios, in Greek. Okay, that's a translation. That's, a, that's the interpretation. The literal translation is, I am not worthy. Okay? All right, that's the second time. And then he repeats it. This in verse 7, look at verse 7. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy. Okay? Now, if you stay with me, when Luke repeats it three times, that's important. Okay? The first time, the first time, who says it? I love this. The elders, the religious people, the church leaders, that's what the synagogue, synagogue is. It's the Old Covenant Church. They point to him and they say, He is worthy! He is worthy! He deserves it! Translation, Jesus, you owe him. Right? And then the centurion inverts it. He points to himself and says, I'm not worthy. Says it twice. I'm not worthy for you to come. I'm not worthy to be in the same room. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. I'm not worthy. Okay? Are you with me? All right. So, what's happening? I get so excited because this is just the gospel here. The, the, the elders are saying... Jesus, he deserves, he's worthy. Therefore, 
please do this. Please do what he asks. He's good. He's virtuous. He loves our country. He's generous. He's a giver. He deserves it. He's worthy, so please do what he asks. That's what they're saying, okay? The centurion says, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. But please do what I ask. Now, if, if you get this, you understand this is crazy. This is a complete flip. Now, let, let me just break it down more simply, okay? Bite size, bite size, bite size. If the centurion says, I'm not worthy, therefore, don't do what I say. Don't do what I ask. That makes sense. The elders say, he's worthy, please do what he asks. If the centurion says, I'm not worthy, don't do what I ask. That makes sense. That makes complete sense. Because that is the way all of us live. That's the way all of us live. Hindu, one more time, Hinduism. Hinduism is a collection of spiritual and ritual teachings, the goal of which is self-knowledge. You want to know yourself. Okay? The reason you want to know yourself is so you can master yourself, so you can live a good life. That's Hinduism. Christianity is different. Christianity's goal is not self-knowledge or self-actualization or self-mastery. The goal of Christianity is not to know yourself, it's to know God. That's the goal. Because if you know God, you will understand yourself in relation to your Creator. And if you know yourself in relation to Creator, you will have a better life. You will have the blessing of God come through to you. Okay. What does that mean? Just like every other religion, every other philosophy, even non-religions, it means if I understand, if I do the right things, if I live the right way, if I, if I meditate enough, if I live a virtuous life, if I'm a moral person, I will be worthy of good things. And we do that here too. You don't have to be a Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist. You ever come to church and think, I don't deserve to be here? You ever stand on the stage and think, if they knew what I was doing last night or this morning, right? If you feel that way, if you've ever thought that way, you're still not getting the gospel. You're still trying to be your own savior. If you think your behavior, your thoughts, your good deeds, your morality makes you worthy or unworthy to be here, to receive the grace of God, that's not the gospel. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. But the more, now you got to get to the centurion. Many of us are centurions. What I mean by that is, we've got to come to the place where we say, Jesus, I am not worthy, but please do what I ask anyway. Instead of, I'm not worthy, therefore don't do what I ask. I, I don't deserve it, so you don't give it to me. No, 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 no. Throw it away. Throw away your morality. Throw away your self-righteousness. Throw away your own good virtue. And take on the virtue of Jesus Christ. Receive his virtue. Receive his worthiness. Receive it from him. That's the gospel. That's the inversion. It's not what you do. It's... So, last illustration and we're good. We're good. It's not the strength of your faith. Okay, I know it says, what great faith. What great faith. But that's to shame the Israelites. It's not the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith. It's not the direction of your faith. It's the perfection of your faith. Here's what I mean. Two, two climbers are going up the mountain. 
very dangerous mountain. They slip and they lose their way and now they're on a very small piece of ledge. And the only way to get out is this way. There's a small piece of land ledge right here that they could step on and there's one small ledge here they could step on. Now, one climber, he says, okay, if we step on this, we'll be able to j jump on that and go over that way. I'm sure, I'm certain, I have no doubts, this is the right way to go. Right? The other climber thinks, okay, but I think this is the right one. I think if we go on this one, we'll be safe, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm not, I have my doubts, but I, I think this is it. So the first climber, 100% assurance, full confidence, knows, he believes with all his heart. Gets on this ledge, it breaks, it doesn't hold his weight, he falls and he's dead. Okay? The second climber, he has his doubts, he jumps on this ledge, it holds him, and he's okay. Right? It wasn't the strength of his belief. He didn't have to believe with all his heart. It was the object of his faith. Yes? That's what was important. Now a lot of people in this world say, you don't have to believe in Jesus, you don't have to believe in Muslims or, or Muhammad. It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe with all your heart. That's all you need. Now, common sense says that's just silly. Hitler believed with all his heart. Did that go well? No. Because it's not the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith. Right? Not the direction, but the perfection of Jesus Christ. That's what this is showing. You humble yourself. Yes, you, you have doubts and, and you struggle and you fight. But oh, thank God, it does not depend on you. It depends all on Jesus Christ. That's what we need. Now, I'm sorry I said this was the end, but now I've got to get to the cross. Sorry. Okay. How, does, how do we get to there? How do we get there? I want to tell you there's one more centurion. Okay? Not this one, but it's at the end of the story. Jesus Christ is on the cross. Right? Crown of thorns, blood, sweat, just fluids everywhere. People are laughing at him, mocking him, Jews, foreigners, women, children, young, old. And he takes all of it in, and you know what he says? Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. He's loving, he's serving, he's forgiving. One man is watching Jesus through the whole thing. It's a centurion. He sees Jesus dying on the cross and he says, Surely this is the Son of God. Now, the first centurion in our story sees the power of Jesus. The power of God. And he believes in Jesus' authority. The centurion at the end of the story sees the power of God in all its work. The greatest show of God's power is the cross of Jesus Christ. And that centurion understands this is the Son of God. Ah, I, I hope I meet that centurion someday. Someday in the New Jerusalem. So where are you? How are you doing? How's your journey? How's your faith? Doesn't need to be great like this centurion. You just need to believe and trust in the work and the word of Jesus Christ. We're going to move to our, uh, our communion time. If you see Jesus on the cross and put your trust in that, that's the beginning. That's the beginning. So, Father, I pray now for this small group of believers, myself included. I have my doubts. I have my questions. 
I'm still waiting on you for certain answers and even healing in certain areas. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Come help me. Now, my Savior, I come to thee.